Greetings. Today, we're going to talk about seamless blockchain integration for the IBC ecosystem. It's a horrible title, and I have no idea what I was thinking there. But anyways, let's kick this off with a quick survey. OK, two questions. And if, you, if your answer is yes, you have to raise your hand. So question one, do you think your grandparents could navigate between applications on different blockchains? No, they don't want to use phones. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Thank you. So that's a no. All right. Do you think there is a lot of redundancy and wasted resources in having every layer one blockchain that's launching, like Neutron, like Archway, reinvent the same basic apps? like DEXs, like liquid stake, and all over again instead of building something new? Yes. So if the answer is yes? Nice. OK. Lots of hands. Thank you for proving my point here. So this talk will be all about how we can simplify the navigation between the or inside this fragmented application ecosystem, and how we can ensure that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time there's a new chain, and how we can provide these tools like DEXs and flash loans to these chains as they launch. So the obvious question is, how can we do this? And what's the connection with White Whale? So we'll find out soon. But before we really dive deep into what problems White Whale is solving, let's try to get a better understanding of, of the problem itself. So when we're going to start with uh, Yes, please come in. Another trusted validator, Enigma. <laughs> Welcome. So imagine you're, you're constructing a house. You know, first thing that you think of is probably walls, windows, covering the roof, those kind of things. And they really they make up your house. But I can imagine you also want to have access to water, to electricity, or to a road. And those things, they are separate from your house. But you still need them to complete it. But you don't want to build them yourself. So they're infrastructure. And ideally, like with electricity, you can just plug and play into the network, and it works. So obviously, there is a strong difference in, in the context when it comes to decentralized applications, in the sense that you know, we're not building houses, we're building apps. But the problem remains the same. So there are some parts of your application that make it unique. And then there are some parts of your application that some primitives it uses. So it, it builds on top of different stacks of the network. So let me give you a couple of examples. If you want to have, or if you have a lending market, and you want to have the most out of it, you want to offer users the ability to loop, you know, to allow leveraging seamlessly. You need an exchange for this. If you have an ecosystem and a vibrant economy, like there's a lot of taxes and lots of lending markets, you better have flash loans to stabilize the markets. And if you have a yield-bearing protocol, you might want to use liquid staking to stack utility and to you know, free up the capital. So exchanges, flash loans, liquid staking, they're really the, the roads and pipes of your house. Their infrastructure, in a sense that they facilitate more complex applications to be built on top. So they're primitives. And if we examine the current state of our ecosystem, we can see that A, these primitives, they're often unavailable where they're needed. So for example, you cannot leverage trade on UMI. You cannot trade your liquid staked stars into NFTs on Stargaze. And when they are available, most of the time it's just a waste of resources because it's a fork, it's a you know, copycat, there's no innovation. It's just a layer one chain paying half a million to a team to fork a DEX, and that's it. Lots of waste of resources, so we don't, the Cosmos doesn't innovate. You know, with Neutron and Archway, what's on those chains right now? You know, a DEX. Nothing new. So I believe we can do better than this, and we'll soon find out how we can do this. In, in. But um, before we get to that, another thing we need to remember is that 
those problems are our problems. Like those are problems of builders. Users don't care about this. They don't care about you know the spending of a blockchain or what infrastructure DEX it uses. They care about good products, and they care about that those products just work. So just something to keep in mind. This is our problem. So in that sense, let's let's dedicate a moment here to the users and discuss their pain points. So fragmentation of applications, this is something we, we touched early on in the introduction, that's quite a massive, massive, massive pain point for users. So picture, you have a smartphone, and your smartphone can only run a single app. And if you want to have like three or four apps, you need to carry multiple smartphones, which is completely ridiculous. But right now, the way it works in, in crypto is that most applications just live on a single chain. So that's a you know, very hard time to, to access these chains. And to make the point even worse, navigating between these chains or ap applications on the different chains is not only a user experience nightmare, but also a security nightmare. So one lousy transaction and your funds are stuck in an IBC escrow account lost in the void. And let's not get started on the bridge hacks. You know, that, that just happen on a monthly basis, you know, millions and billions of dollars. And another pain point is fractured liquidity. So essentially that means that you know, liquidity is on different chains, but it cannot flow freely to where it's needed. And when you want to access the liquidity, for example, you're a whale and you want to market by something very large, you cannot. So this leads to a very bad price or trading experience and also a very bad, so high volatility, unnecessary. Because if someone you know, market buys a lot of tokens on one chain, this doesn't mean that the price propagates to the other chains. So there's a lot of ups, ups and downs. And at the end of the day, those who use the protocols, they suffer from this. And those points, they're obviously by all means not comprehensive. So <coughs> bless you. So users in crypto, they have a lot more problems. But in the scope of, our, of, of this presentation, those three are quite major points that I believe we can solve. So the obvious question now is, <laughs> bless you, Bernardo. The obvious question now is, how can we solve the builder's problems and the user's problems at the same time? And the answer to this question starts with an initiative we call Ride the Whale. It's, it's very cheesy. But the right group essentially is a group of, of teams, Whitewell, Backbone Labs, Eris Protocol, and Raccoon. And our goal is to build true cross-chain apl applications that are tightly integrated into each other. So there's a cross-chain utility suit that we can ship to new chains wherever they are needed. So let's take a look at them. So Whitewell is obviously the, you know, we, we started this initiative, we are at the heart of this, and we have those satellite markets, they contain, contain a DEX and flash loan vaults. And they're live on six chains right now. And Backbone Labs, they are one of our early supporters. In, you know, they realized our vision and supported us early on. They have multiple liquid staking solutions. And they also offer you know, a, a unique twist where they power um, NFT collections with the yield of their protocol. So they call it NFT Fi, which is quite interesting. And they also have the number one NFT marketplace on Terra. Eris Protocol, another great team building with us right from the start. They, too, offer liquid staking solutions. I think they're live on more than a dozen chains right now. Um, but they're more, fo more focused on, on DeFi and arbitrage vaults and yield vaults. They are the second largest liquid staking provider in the whole Cosmos ecosystem by TVL. So that's quite impressive. And Raccoon is the latest team to join our you know, cross-chain movement. Um, they are the premier cross-chain gaming applications with um, like multiple games. And they also have the number one NFT marketplace on Chihuahua. And together, we've been operating as a, as a loose joint venture where we ship these, these suit of products to different chains. And so far, we've been able to provide utility and you know, core infrastructure like DEXs, like flash loans, like record staking to um, yeah, a growing number of chains. So the right group is building cross-chain applications. 
you know, trying to solve these builders' problems by pro by providing you know core DeFi infrastructure to the places where they need it. So not every chain has to reinvent this, but still, you know, these protocols they need a home, they need a token, they need a DAO. So that's why we created Migalu, the home of the interchain protocols. And Migalu is a permissionless Cosmosm blockchain with all the latest bells and whistles. And over the last couple of years, we noticed that, and I'm sure you guys noticed as well, that bad tokenomics can really break an ecosystem. So I'm not going to name any names, but I'm sure everybody can think of a couple of layer one chains that um, had very bad tokenomics, which eventually broke them. So that's why we were extra careful in you know, not making the same mistake twice. We were, you know, we tried to get the parameters and all the all the tokenomics right from the start. So we have just a base inflation of four percent. So that allows us um, to continue the ecosystem growth to spur economic growth. But at the same time, Migalu has one of the lowest emissions in the whole ecosystem. And we also been very careful to select fifty fantastic validators to power the chain. So Enigma is one of them. And Really, almost every validator on Migalu contributes to the success of the chain in some form or another. So we have, for example, teams like Notional, who help us maintain the code. We have teams like Polkachu, providing infrastructure. Orbital Command, over there, providing content creation and helping us in the politics arena. Teams like Enigma, helping us to index data so we get more insight for our applications. So all in all, a very active, very active and tightly knitted validator set, which just contributes to the success of the whole ecosystem in a lot of different ways. And thanks to the fantastic team at Rockaway, we were able to, able to decentralize the chain also in very, in various dynamics to great success, so that we can now comfortably say that Migalu is, even though it has a very small market cap right now. It is still, however, one of the most decentralized and robust chains in a lot of different di or dimensions. So that's quite impressive. And you know, lastly, Migalu is also pioneering various you know, interesting technologies like Alliance, which essentially is cross-chain staking. So there's lots of talk about interchain security, lots of buzz, lots of buzz about mesh security, which isn't even live. But we have you know, cross-chain staking live for four months now, and it's working Fantastically. So right now you can go to Migalu, stake your Luna, and earn Whale. So that's quite cool. And we have lots of plans to, to utilize this because Alliance really is a, a monetary policy tool. So think about you have inflation 100% and it's like a stream. And right now the full stream blows to the, or flows to the stakers. But like, the, like how governments subsidy or do subsidies for certain sectors, certain industries, for certain amounts of time, it makes, you know, it makes a lot of sense to do something similar in, in the blockchain space because really we're trying to build an economy here. So we're um, most likely going to utilize Alliance to, for example, bootstrap ecosystem tokens. So tokens that launch on Migalu, that build an application there, we can subsidize them and bootstrap them. So that's a, you know, very interesting and pioneering area that we're also you know, pushing forward. All right, now it gets a little bit more complicated. So we, we got the, you know, the right group building cross-chain applications. We got the, the chain Migalu we have, you know, the home of the interchain protocols. But how does everything work together? Like what's the, what's the catch here? So Let's just start by an example. So let's consider you have some whale, that's the token powering the chain, and you have it on Migalu. And like on any, any other Cosmos chain, you can stake the token, you earn part of the 4% inflation, you can participate in governance, so far nothing special. But since we're using Alliance, you're also earning a basket of assets, like the ecosystem tokens eventually, or LP tokens, or Luna. So right now, when you stake Whale, you're earning Luna. So that's the first interesting thing we're having on our chain. Then, since we're working together with Backbone Labs and Aries Protocol, which are two liquid staking providers, we also have two liquid, stake, 
staking tokens for whale, amp whale and bone whale. So you can capture this dynamic of this you know, appreciating asset and this basket of assets in a liquid staking token. So you liquid stake your whale. And here is where it gets really interesting. We have our cross-chain satellite markets, live on six chains, the DEXs and the flash loans. And then the tightly integrated applications of Backbone Labs, Ares Protocol, and Raccoon around our satellite markets, like this whole suite of products. And on every swap and on every flash loan that happens on any of our satellite markets, there's a fee taken in whatever token they're swapped or taking a flash loan off. And that fee is used to buy back whale from the open market every day on every chain. And if a user wants to X or get access to that real yield, he can take now his liquid staked whale, which is already appreciating against whale because it's a liquid staking token. He can take that to any of our satellite market. So you're on Migalu, you liquid stake your whale, now you send it over to Terra. Lock it there again on our satellite market, and then every time the market does a buyback, it distributes that proportionally to you. And this system that we're building here, it scales vertically. So if we get more teams in our right group that, that integrate with our DEX, volume goes up, more fees. If the ecosystem itself we're on, like we're on Injective, for example, so if Injective keeps on growing, the satellite market volume will grow as well. So it scales vertically with the chains. But the really groundbreaking thing here is this scales horizontally. So as we go to more chains, the value adds up. It sums up. Every new chain is a new market with new liquidity, new fees, new buybacks, new users. And we have, we have quite a long list of chains we want to deploy on. So we're going to deploy on Luna Classic soon. UMI is very high up the list, and Stargaze as well. So, and as we grow horizontally, there's more markets, more whale will be locked up to access the yield, which is ever growing. So right now on Terra, this system has been live for almost three months in production, and we still have a real yield APR of 10% on top of the liquid staking token, which you lock there. So it will, be, it will become very interesting to see how that system behaves and develops as we scale horizontally. And one of the also, I think, underappreciated facts of this model is that it allows us to be very, very flexible. You know, the, the Cosmos ecosystem or crypto in general is very fast paced. So if you, if you just focus on a single chain, that chain might you know, work out well or not. But your application lives and dies with that ecosystem. For us, we don't care. You know, if one of the chain would die, of course it would be very unfortunate, but we'd still have five other markets running and we can have a long list of markets to continue deploying on. So we can be wherever the music plays. That's a very flexible model. Um, let me try getting the next slide here, yeah. All right, That's, that was quite a lot to swallow. I know, I see a lot of question marks and, and a lot of eyes. But when we think back to the builders' problems we discussed earlier, we found out that many blockchains, they really need these, these primitives, these, these DEXs, the flash loans, the liquid staking tokens, and ideally in a plug-and-play way that is cheap and fast. So they can focus on what makes them unique. So that's why we created another program, and now it gets even cheesier than the right program, which is the Sail with the Whale program. So while p teams, like protocols, can join the right program to scale to the next level, like we help them grow you know, to a cross-chain protocol, the sale program allows blockchains to get access to all these different applications and the liquidity and the community and all that. And it, it works quite simply, so there can just be a governance proposal. Chain decides to join the, the sale program, and then we start deploying our applications there. So DEX, flash loans, liquid staking, NFT marketplace, MEV bots, and so on. And as the portfolio of products grows, the offer becomes more and more appealing to chains. So just to give you a couple of examples here. So on Chihuahua, there is a proposal live on chain right now. It's still in the voting phase, but it's getting overwhelming support so that Chihuahua will be the first chain to join the right uh, sale program. 
And what's interesting is why I always have to you know, smirk a little bit. So everybody's looking down on Chihuahua like a useless meme chain, but Chihuahua got a fully supported DEX, three liquid staking tokens, NFT marketplace, games, flash loans, and MEV bots. And I can count a lot of layer one chains with 100 times that market cap, which have a fraction of that applications on their chain. So just on a side note here. Um, Injective is another also very interesting example of you know, a chain that, that benefits from, from the utility we bring. So if you have, they have this order book, right? And order books, they're notorious for volatility. So if the buy or sell orders break, there is you know, lots of ups and down movements. But if you place an AMM next to it, you can trade the AMM against the order book. And in that sense, it acts as some kind of a price anchor. So every time the order book moves, it drags the AMM with it, like a, with a delay. And that it increases stability, it increases fees for the whole ecosystem. So in general, it's just an improvement. So we've been on live on Injective for half a year now stabilizing the exchange and providing flash loans and liquidity there. And UMI, another fascinating example. We're not live there yet, but they're number two of our list that, you know, next upcoming deployments. They have a lending market, and as we said earlier, if you want to get the most out of your lending market, you need an exchange, because otherwise you can't loop. So we're quite happy to, you know, shoot for a deployment on UMI within the next one or two months, and I think that will be quite a groundbreaking thing not only for us, but also for them. Oh, we're coming to the end. So I think by now everybody is in the clear that the future of decentralized finance is not going to be living on a single chain, much like the internet isn't living on a single server. And I believe the future is multi-chain. And to facilitate that transition, we're trying to help teams scale to the next level and build cross-chain applications with the right program. And we're trying to provide blockchains access to core primitives so they can focus on what really matters instead of reinventing the wheel with a sale program. And by enabling all these builders to build great applications, we're actually solving the user's problems by uniting the ecosystem and providing a seamless experience. And in other words, we're building the decentralized economy of the future. And in that sense, Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Questions? Bernardo, it's on your lips. <laughs> um, this might be a dumb question and not very technical, but will you guys like do the ultimate like uh, app, ride the well app? Like you guys are four different entities. Will I have to use the four different entities So they're separate. They're separate because it's separate teams. Yeah. So it's it's a very loose joint venture. Care about that. Yeah. Um, I, I think ultimately this has to be a community effort because the contracts are all there. So it would just be building a new front end that combines it. Okay. I think it makes sense for a couple of purposes. For some purposes, it doesn't make so much because, for example, Raccoon they do games. So th there's little use case in putting games in the same context as flash loans, yeah. you know? Um, but yeah, some, some nice unified interface is, is, a, is a good way to onboard new people. Good question, thank you, Bernardo. <laughs> so I heard the Yumi against the Tesla chart. Luna Classic first and then yeah. Yumi, yeah. Oh yeah, we have quite we have quite a lot. Um, just on top of my head, I'm gonna name a couple of names now. Um, Luna Classic Umi, and then without any specific order, Archway Neutron Say, Stargaze, Composable Finance, which is in the Polkadot ecosystem, which is quite interesting for us, because we would, you know, I, I said earlier, we're, with this model is very flexible because of course we have our chain with the whole ecosystem there. But with the satellite markets, we can really go everywhere where the music plays. And if we want, want to go to EVM eventually, we just have to rewrite our contracts in, in Solidity, and boom, we're on a complete cross-chain 
cross languages, like a truly multi-ecosystem project. And I think that's a fr very flexible approach and that will allow us to navigate this you know, fast moving space quite well. But yeah, it's a long list and we probably cannot keep up with the demand. <laughs> it's very long. Thank you. Any further questions? Well. Oh yeah, don't buy. <laughs> don't, don't buy Ash. Yeah, it's it's something from us. So we we didn't um, we didn't build it or maintain it. Um, but so I didn't touch touch on that part of our tokenomics in the in the presentation because I thought it would be a little bit overkill. But we have four percent inflation and this you know. Migaloo value capture mechanism, it's a full-blown layer one, and also that of the satellite markets, which scales horizontally and vertically. And the satellite markets do these buybacks every day. And that's just one part of our tokenomics. The second part is that we have the 4% inflation, which we need to get economic, economic growth, but we want to offset that inflation by having burn mechanisms. So what, what crypto allows you to do, which I think is very fascinating, is Contrary to the normal economy, where you have an asset that's either inflationary, so it dilutes you, or it's, you have an asset that's deflationary. In crypto, you can have both at the same time. So you can have an asset that, if you stake it, it prints you, but at the same time, while you're getting more, the total supply shrinks. And that, I believe, is the, the holy gray of, of assets there is, because you have the best of both worlds. Because you got the inflation, so there's movement, there's economic activity, there's you know use case for you to utilize the token because you know you can lend it, you can you know mint tokens with it like stable coins, but also you have the properties of a deflationary token, where you think, all right, I'm never gonna sell this shit because I know tomorrow there will be less tokens, and we're trying to achieve this um, with Whale as well. As we scale more horizontally, we'll have burn mechanisms in place, so part of the way we buy it back will be burned. So even though, even if we might not you know, reach to the inflection point of deflation, we still might to be able to offset inflation. So the token, if you stake it, prints you 4%, but the total supply just increases by 1%, for example. So yeah, and the ash token, not to make the, <laughs> complete the circle, the ash token allows you to burn whale on, so there's a furnace app, and in the furnace you put in the whale, and then it, it's gone, and you get a burn derivate back, which is called ash. So it's it, it's kind of like a f like a gamified thing because there's leaderboards and stuff, and you know Eris Protocol, for example, they um, they burn tokens with their protocol. I think Backbone Labs will do the same, and then you got like competitions based on ecosystem contributions by protocols, and also individuals. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a gamified si part of our tokenomics because the burn mechanism is actually quite an important thing in this vision. And you get this ash token back, which is just a useless burn derivate. Uh, but apparently, people have been buying this, so it's been doing 20x in like half a day. So it's don't buy. So that same thing is, it's like for the leader board. More ash you got, more burning you got, more you need to keep the GP. <laughs> Well, the idea is that, I mean, the, the furnace could have been built without the burn derivate, derivate, so you just burn it and you got nothing. But why not give a, a derivative back? You know, you can build a secondary economy around it. You can have, you know, Ash NFT collections, Ash DAOs. You know, let the community do something. You know, that's community driven. We're not doing this. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for your...